hello, everyone. Good afternoon, and thank you for joining the National Conference of State Legislatures and the Pew Charitable Trust for this briefing on state tax incentives. My name is Mandy Rafel, and I'm a program principal in the Fiscal Affairs Department of the National Conference of State Legislatures. I will be serving as the moderator of today's webinar, Making the Costs of Tax Incentives More Predictable. As a reminder, if at any time during this webinar you have any difficulty hearing the audio through your computer speakers, please use your telephone to dial in to hear the audio portion. Next slide, please. The National Conference of State Legislatures is pleased to partner with the Pew Charitable Trust to bring you this webinar. In case you're not familiar with NCSL, we are a bipartisan organization that serves the legislators and staffs of the, 50, the nation's 50 states, its commonwealths, and territories. NCSL provides a number of different services, including research, testimony, and opportunity for lawmakers to exchange ideas on pressing state policy issues. The subject of state tax incentives falls within the jurisdiction of two NCSL standing committees, the Committee on Budgets and Revenue and the Labor and Economic Development Committee. These standing committees provide a forum for the exchange of ideas, as well as a framework for legislators to create formal public policy positions for NCSL. The committees meet twice a year at the NCSL Legislative Summit and the NCSL Capital Forum. For more information on these meetings or NCSL activities and services to legislators and legislative staff, please visit our website at ncsl.org. Next slide. The purpose of this jointly sponsored webinar is to examine state efforts to reduce fiscal risk when creating tax incentives and discuss how states can forecast the future costs of incentives after they have been implemented. I can tell you from my work at NCSL that this topic is very timely and has generated a lot of interest over the past few years. Initially, because states were desperate for revenues during the recession, and lawmakers began to look at tax expenditures as a potential revenue source, and then later as revenues recovered because it became apparent that tax incentives weren't being tracked very closely in most states once they were on the books. I understand today's webinar audience is one of the biggest that we've ever had for a webinar, and I think this just reflects the growing interest we're seeing in state tax incentives and how policymakers want to make sure they are well designed to begin with and then make certain that they can effectively evaluate them after implementation. Today's webinar features three presentations. The first presentation will highlight research conducted by the Pew Charitable Trust that shows how states can avoid budgetary surprises while using incentives to achieve economic goals. This discussion will be followed by a presentation from a state revenue officer and from a state legislator. Each of them will share different state experiences and perspectives. After we hear from our panelists, we will open up the discussion to include questions from the audience. To ask questions, you can simply type a question in the Q&A box in the right-hand corner of your screen. Your question will not be visible to everyone, only to the webinar administrators. We will take as many questions as possible within the time we have available. Next slide, please. Our first speaker, Josh Goodman, is an expert on economic development tax incentives with Pew State Fiscal Health and Economic Growth Project. Josh served as the lead writer for Pew's first two research reports on tax incentives, Evidence Counts, Evaluating State Tax Incentives for Jobs and Growth, and Avoiding Blank Checks, Creating Fiscally Sound State Tax Incentives. Since joining the tax incentive team in 2013, he has provided technical assistance to lawmakers proposing evaluation laws and to state analysts setting tax incentives. Next slide, please. Our second presenter will be John Estes, who serves as the Director of Public Affairs in the State of Oklahoma's Central Finance and Operations Agency. He works closely with the Cabinet Secretary as one of the Governor's top problem solvers and a leader in efforts to modernize state government. He also works as one of the Governor's lead budget negotiators with the legislature and was involved in crafting Oklahoma's new law that requires regular evaluation of state tax incentives. Next slide. Our third and final speaker will be State Senator Joe Bolcom, 
who is currently serving his fifth term in the Iowa Senate. He is the Senate Majority Whip and Chair of the Ways and Means Committee. He also serves as a co-chair of the Joint Legislative Tax Expenditure Committee, where duties include approving annual estimates of the cost of tax expenditures by December 15th each year, and performing a scheduled review of specified tax credits so that each credit is reviewed at least every five years. We look forward to hearing from all three of our distinguished speakers and thank them all for agreeing to participate in this session today. So now I will turn the program over to Josh Goodman. Welcome, Josh. Great. Thank you so much, Mandy. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you all very much for joining us today. Um, as Mandy mentioned, my project at Pew focuses on helping states make their economic development incentives more effective, accountable, and fiscally sound. And in that spirit, we released a new report titled Reducing Budget Risks Last Month. This research was in response to something we've been seen going on in state after state in recent years. The costs of incentives have increased quickly and unexpectedly by tens or hundreds of millions of dollars, often without policymakers intending to expand the programs. As a result, some states have had to deal with significant budget problems. For this research, we reviewed numerous state documents and news articles and conducted phone interviews with more than 40 government officials and experts from 20 states. What we found is that the problems are not inevitable. Many states have proved that incentives can be used effectively without throwing budgets out of balance. One of the most prominent recent examples of these challenges is in Michigan. Last year, tax credits under a program called MEGA cost the state hundreds of millions of dollars, more than expected. As a result, lawmakers were forced to make mid-year budget cuts. This isn't just a short-term challenge for Michigan. Instead, even though the state is no longer letting new companies enter MEGA, the program is still expected to cost billions of dollars through at least 2032. Part of the problem was that the state lacked a reliable process for forecasting the cost of, costs of the incentives. As you can see on this, this slide, state officials made three very different estimates of the state's commitment under the program at three different points in time. The biggest reason these numbers increased wasn't because the state authorized new tax credits. Instead, it was because the state refined its forecasting methods. The original forecasts, for example, relied on flawed wage growth assumptions. MEGA also lacked key fiscal protections. There was no limit on how much the program could cost, nor was there clarity about when the costs would occur. Companies were earning incentives on an uncertain schedule over the course of many years. When programs involve those kinds of long-term commitments, states have often struggled to predict how much the programs will cost from year to year. None of these challenges are unique to Michigan. In lots of states, policymakers are unsure how much tax incentives will cost and what year they will affect the budget. Next slide, please. In Michigan, there was a silver lining. One reason that the costs of mega increased surprisingly, was the stronger than expected recovery of the auto industry. In many instances, however, incentives that cause budget problems are not achieving their economic goals either. Unexpected costs are often a sign that the programs are poorly designed or poorly targeted. What that means is that making the costs of incentives more predictable can make the programs more economically effective as well. For instance, design flaws were one of the primary reasons the costs of New Mexico's high wage jobs tax credit quintupled from 2011 to 2012. Under the program, companies were allowed to claim jobs they added through mergers and acquisitions as new jobs, even if the deals did not increase net employment in New Mexico. Likewise, there was no time limit for applying for the credit. Many companies were claiming incentives for jobs they had created many years earlier some of which no longer even existed at that point. In 2013, lawmakers approved several significant reforms to the program. From our conversations with state officials, it was clear that there are two primary strategies to address these problems. One is for states to gather and share high quality data on the costs of incentives. And the second is to design incentives in ways that reduce fiscal risk. Within each of these two overarching strategies, our report presented several specific options. And I'm just going to highlight a few of the options today, but I'd certainly be happy to take questions about any of the others. I'll start with gathering and sharing high quality data. 
Missouri is one of the states that has developed, developed a consistent process for forecasting the costs of its incentives. For each program, the state's Department of Economic Development projects the value of credits that will be authorized, issued, and redeemed in both the current year and the next budget year. This chart that you see on the slide shows why this analysis is worthwhile. In 2013, Missouri lawmakers created a new incentive called Missouri Works. Under Missouri Works, companies are authorized to receive tax credits up front and are then allowed to redeem them over the next six years if they meet job creation standards. The program cost the state less than $150,000 in fiscal 2014. In some states, that figure would be the only one reported and the program would not appear to be a significant commitment. In Missouri, however, the state also tracks the tax credit tax credits that are authorized, $116 million in fiscal 2014. With that information, policymakers can anticipate the costs of these programs potentially years in advance. To develop forecasts like these, different state agencies have to work together. In Missouri, the Department of Revenue and Department of Economic Development share a unified database with tax credit information, allowing data to pass quickly between the two departments. Now I'll move on to how incentives are designed. One of the strongest protections against incentives costing more than intended is an annual limit or cap on program costs. Most states have placed caps on at least some of their incentives, but few states have used them consistently. One reason lawmakers have sometimes shied away from caps is that they're worried the money will run out before the year is over and that as a result, incentives won't be available when a promising business is ready to expand later in the year. When California lawmakers created a new incentive called the California Competes Tax Credit, they designed it in such a way to avoid that problem. The Governor's Office of Economic Development stages three competitions a year for tax credits under the program. Businesses submit applications and then the economic development officials offer credits to the ones that they decide are most promising. Each competition has its own cap. Since the competitions are staggered throughout the year, Money is available whenever businesses are ready to grow. States can also set annual limits on incentive programs by requiring that incentives be funded by appropriations, just like other gov government programs. An appropriations process is more common for cash incentives such as grants and loans, but it can work for tax incentives too. This approach not only makes the cost of incentives more predictable, it also provides an impetus for lawmakers to scrutinize programs that might otherwise not be reviewed. In Florida's budget each year, lawmakers set how much money will be available for several of the state's programs, including both cash and tax incentives. This approach has encouraged policymakers to study the programs in more depth, with the governor and legislators engaging in a healthy debate over the right level of funding for the programs and how their effectiveness can be improved. One reason states have sometimes been reluctant to require appropriations for incentives is that they're worried that doing so will cause uncertainty for businesses. If businesses don't know whether what lawmakers will decide in terms of funding for the program, they may be left unsure as to whether they will receive benefits. But there are ways around that problem. When a company is approved for Minnesota's Job Creation Fund, the department and business enter into an agreement where the incentives are guaranteed so long as the company meets required job creation or investment thresholds. The Economic Development Department can hold on to the money to ensure it will be able to pay the incentives for the life of the agreement. It does not have to spend dollars that lawmakers appropriate to the fund in the same budget year in which they're appropriated. Some of the incentive programs that have caused states problems are ones where there is no interaction between the company and the state until the company claims the incentives on its taxes. At that point, the money is already going out the door, and it may be too late for the state to prepare if the costs are higher than expected. If programs are designed so that companies have to provide advance notice that they are participating, these surprises can be avoided. Under Utah's Economic Development Tax Increment Financing Program, or EDTIF program, companies enter into long-term incentive contracts with the state's Economic Development Office before they begin receiving incentives. Having those contracts has helped the state come up with estimates of the cost. In 2014, the State Auditor's Office used these contracts to project that the state's EDTIF commitment would double to $1.3 billion over the next 10 years. 
I'll conclude by mentioning a few things legislators can do to make sure incentives are not costing more than expected. First, whenever you create a new incentive or modify an existing one, legislators can consider whether adequate protections are in place, whether you have the design features um, that we talk about in the report to make sure that it won't cost more than intended down the road. Second, economic development agencies, revenue departments, and legislative fiscal staff need to be working together well to, to get lawmakers the data they need on the costs of incentives. Legislators can make sure these agencies have what they need to produce good estimates, whether that is technology to help share information effectively or policies that allow records to pass from agency to agency. Finally, you can set up a process to regularly review your existing incentives. Since the start of 2012, 17 states in the District of Columbia have approved laws requiring regular evaluation of tax incentives or improving existing evaluation processes. These laws generally require nonpartisan professional staff, such as economists, auditors, or program evaluators, to study incentives on a recurring cycle. Tax incentive evaluations are a proven way not only to assess the costs of these programs, but also to measure their economic results. So if you're in a state that is not regularly evaluating its incentives, you should consider how to put such a process in place. If you already have an evaluation law, you can make sure that fiscal risk is part of the equation. Pew has helped states to design and implement some of these laws, so please think of us as a resource whenever you're working on tax incentive evaluation. Thanks so much for your time. Um, and as a reminder, if you have questions, you can start typing them in now, and we'll answer them at the end. Now I'll turn it over to John Estes. John. Thank you, Josh, and thanks to everybody who's who's dialed in today. I am subbing for my boss, uh, Finance Secretary Preston Dorflinger, who is subbing for a Republican legislator to fill the red side of the team. So we are very deep into the bench, uh, but I'm going to do my best to say something that will be meaningful to all of you. Um, our journey on incentives in Oklahoma ha has been <clears throat> a pretty interesting one, and um, as Mandy said in her opening remarks, uh, our, our, our most recent go-around with how to do incentives from a policy perspective, it, re it started in the downturn that we saw in 2008-2009 as our budget hole widened and widened. Uh, as legislators are prone to do, they had to look for ways to close it. <clears throat> and they started really for the first time in recent history looking at the cost of our tax incentives, particularly economic incentives that are, are conceivably designed to cause business activity to occur that may not otherwise occur in your state or to increase capital investment by businesses or any number of other things that the incentives may have been intended to do. <clears throat> so as they were trying to close the budget gap in, in those years in 08, 09, and, and 2010, uh, the idea of a moratorium on incentives came up. Uh, they, they were simply looking for money, and the decision was made to place several, not all, but several incentives <clears throat> on a moratorium. That freed up several hundred million dollars a year uh, for those budgets in those lean years. What they did at that time, though, is they caused uh, the moratorium to occur, but they allowed the incentives to accrue during the moratorium. So essentially, we agreed to pay these businesses back later in exchange for them helping us through a couple rough budget years. <clears throat> so fast forward a few a few years, and in 2011, uh, we have a new state treasurer take office, very gifted economist uh, named Ken Miller, who was the House Appropriations Chairman uh, at the time that, that we really started looking at incentives and, and placing them on moratorium for budget reasons. <clears throat> and then Treasurer Miller started doing something that no treasurer before him had done, and, and we we think it's it's been a great thing because it's it's caused a better discussion of of really how the finances of the government work than we've ever had in Oklahoma. Uh, Treasurer Miller started putting out a monthly report on all of the money the state collects. It's called the Gross Collections to the Treasury Report. Uh, previously, my agency, uh, under its former incarnation as the State Finance Office and now as the State um, Office of Management and Enterprise Services, we put out a monthly report on our general revenue fund collections, which as all of you know in, in most states is your main operating account for state government. Uh, so our report shows all the money that's left over for the government to use and the legislature to appropriate after money is sent to city and counties, after tax refunds, credits and deductions are considered, after mandatory spending is taken care of through the apportionment process. Uh, the report that we've put out for decades shows what the government could spend for the budget. <clears throat> 
but the government obviously collects more money than that, and the treasurer started reporting that figure every month. Uh, so he got to report very nice, big, rosy, always growing figures every month. And his report would come out on the first day of the month, ours comes out on the second Tuesday of the month, and they were saying different things. Uh, each month, and, and legislators were were confused, and the press was confused, and people were saying, "Wow, why is Treasurer Merrill saying, wow, look at look at the all the money we have? We were running out of adjectives to describe all the money the Treasurer said we were collecting." And then here comes Secretary Dorflanger in the Budget Office saying, "Oh, look, your collections are down here, they're down there, and and we don't have as much money as we thought we were going to have. You're going to have to make tough decisions." <clears throat> that. Uh, dichotomy that existed caused legislators to, to pay more attention, I think, to where all the money the, the government collects actually goes after it is collected. Uh, we have term limits in Oklahoma, so uh, we have a, had a lot of new legislators come in, and, and they're learning how all these things work. But we, the contrast from the two reports caused good questions to, to be asked, uh, and, and it really we have a funny saying that we have been using. It's, if Will Rogers was alive today, he's not, but we all love Will Rogers in Oklahoma, but if he was alive, we like to think that he would observe that only in government can you have more money than ever, but less money than last year. And that is the situation that our legislators felt like they had found themselves in with the Treasurer telling them they have all this money and the Budget Office telling them, no, you actually don't have so much. <clears throat> so one reason for that, there's many reasons, but one reason is the cost of our economic incentives has been growing. Uh, it's very hard to forecast those costs. We have a, a gifted tax commission here that generally does a good job of forecasting how much tax revenue we'll collect, but as we've added incentives over the years, as businesses have started claiming them more often, the cost of those has been harder and harder to project. So <clears throat> in 2012, we had a, a fascinating situation where we had collected more money than we ever had collected in state history, yet we had a $188 million budget hole in the appropriated budget, <clears throat> hence the more money than ever, less money than last year uh, moniker that we've been throwing around. The reason for that, all those incentives that accrued during the moratorium uh, were being cashed in. The moratorium had come up the year before, and now all these uh, businesses were following the law and rightly claiming what they're entitled to under tax law, but it, it blew a hole in our budget unexpectedly. And that, that really got legislators' attention, and they uh, I think started taking the idea of evaluating incentives a little more seriously than they had before. Um, they had been looking at incentives a couple years before uh, this this situation developed. We had a a very gifted, very colorful, theatrical representative named David Dank, who who made this his personal crusade to to get to the bottom of every incentive and make sure that it was generating a return on investment. And and he was very colorful very gifted with the press, uh, had the respect of a lot of members on both sides of the aisle, and he uh, held actually a, a series of task force meetings where he would look at an incentive one by one, and, and, and it was very, very illuminating to hear his perspective and other legislators' perspective clash with the business's perspective that was receiving the incentive, uh, and, and that process, uh, I, I, I will admit, because I worked in the Speaker's office at the time, it was mostly anecdotal, it was very theatrical, but it was illuminating. Um, unfortunately, it was based almost entirely on anecdotes. We did not have any empirical data to use to really have an educated discussion about incentives. So businesses rightfully felt like they were under attack just for following the law and collecting incentives that they were entitled to. <clears throat> the government was what was feeling somewhat at a loss because we knew at least some of these had to be working and causing activity to occur that wouldn't otherwise occur or causing businesses to be more prosperous, but we had no data to tell whether they were working. We didn't even know what the goals of some of these incentives were because they've been added by different legislators over a period of many decades. Um, so this, this divide existed between the legislature that at that time was priding itself on being very business friendly and the business community that was saying, look, we're just following the laws that you wrote collecting the incentives you offer, <clears throat> and all of a sudden we're under attack. Um, so so there, there was a gulf there for, for a year or two, and the legislature really felt like it needed to do something about incentives because the cost was growing and it seemed to be blowing holes in our revenue collections every month, and uh, the business community <clears throat> successfully derailed a few attempts, legislative attempts, to rein in incentives in a very broad brush manner where there were bills filed to repeal all incentives and make them all come back one by one by an affirmative vote of the legislature. And, and there were several other comprehensive attempts to just kind of wipe the slate clean and start over. 
those didn't fly, and the issue lingered for a while until we we were able to connect with the Pew Charitable Trust um, and participate in a it was a six or seven state initiative that Pew has led that has produced this report that Josh just ran through, um, and and Pew was able to bridge that divide between the uh, state and the business community and get us really singing from the same sheet of music because we all agreed we need better data on incentives and we need to hopefully learn more about them so we can forecast their costs better so that when a business rightfully claims an incentive they aren't uh, lambasted in front of a committee at the legislature. <clears throat> and, and that process was very useful to Oklahoma. Pew allowed us to heal some wounds that existed and they brought us some some very credible, objective, bipartisan uh, technical assistance to, to look at the cost of our incentives and look at their structure and look at things we might do better. And uh, what we concluded through a really a collaborative policy study with both chambers of the legislature, the executive branch, and the business community was, was we needed to find a way to evaluate every incentive on a regular schedule in a manner that we all agreed was appropriate. Uh, that's how we developed our Incentive Evaluation Act that was passed by the legislature in a very bipartisan manner last session and signed by the governor. And it's kicking off really as we speak. We're about to, to start having some meetings of a commission that's going to oversee it and, and get some evaluations underway. But our, uh, our evaluation process in Oklahoma <clears throat> is simply designed to provide information to the legislature. It, it, it does not require any action on any incentive, uh, but what it does require is that each incentive get reviewed once every four years by an objective third party that's hired by a commission that's been set up. And uh, each incentive will be reviewed under criteria that is specific to that incentive. Uh, we came to recognize that you would not want to interview or interview, review a historic tax credit, for instance, in the same manner that you review the investment new jobs tax credit or our quality jobs program they have different purposes. So our evaluation process accounts for that and causes criteria for each incentive to be developed. And we do that through our, our rulemaking process, which will allow for input from any interested party, any any industry association or business that feels like we should evaluate it some other way, they'll be able to opine on that through the rulemaking process. And that will be considered by this commission that sets the criteria that our, our third party evaluator then uses to evaluate that incentive. What we hope to see in the form of evaluation is a very simple scorecard format, USA Today styled evaluation that is easy to read, easy to understand, and makes a very clear recommendation on whether to retain, reform, or repeal any particular incentive. Uh, we think we would like to see some accompanying reports and some verbiage, but we want an evaluation that any legislator can pick up in committee and work from if they don't have time to read a you know a 90 page report that might accompany it we we had gone through this incentive evaluation process in the past about a decade ago and we set up a committee as we do in, in government and they reviewed some incentives but the the committee was made up of a lot of very gifted academic type folks who who wrote these long 100 page reports that were fascinating for people like me who geek out on it but they sat on the shelves of most legislators because they don't have time to sift through all that. <clears throat> so we're looking for a, a simpler, easy to understand version of evaluation through this process. Um, and, and, and I think we're going to get that. We have we have a lot of good potential here, I believe, to provide better information to policymakers. Um, another thing that we achieved through the Pew process is we're simply asking our tax commission to ask more questions of businesses about what credits they may be eligible for that they're not claiming and and we're trying to get a better handle of what liability we have out there so that we don't have big a big unexpected run on incentives and, and that particular topic has come up recently. We're we're in the middle of another uh, budget hole situation in Oklahoma due to the oil price collapse. We have a about a thirteen percent gap in our appropriated budget. <clears throat> we have a lot of big businesses that are energy companies in Oklahoma that are hurting. And some of our representatives and, and senators have rightly, rightfully been asking us and the tax commission, hey, how much money is out there that these businesses might make a run on and claim in the form of a credit or deduction to help smooth out some of the pain they're feeling because of the oil price? Is that going to make the hits we've been taking even worse when all these businesses make a run on this? And it's, it's a fair question. And it, it's actually very tough for our tax commission to put a dollar amount on that, they're going to do the best they can. But in the future, based on some of the questions we're asking 
businesses in the, on, on their tax forms that the businesses are willingly answering, um, I think we'll be able to answer that question better than we can now. Uh, with that, I'd be happy to turn it over to the good senator from Iowa. Good afternoon, everybody. This is uh, State Senator Joe Bolcom calling from uh, the state capitol here in Des Moines this afternoon. Um, I want to talk about a couple things that Iowa has done to try and address the need for uh, more predictability and accountability for, uh, the, in our case, the nearly $400 million a year uh, that we spend in our tax code on, on a whole host of nearly 40 different uh, tax uh, uh, credits. And uh, I, I would like to start by saying that um, I've been uh, the chair, I've been on the Ways and Means Committee, this is my 18th year in the legislature, I've been in the, on the committee the entire time and since 2007 I've actually been the chair of the committee in the Iowa Senate. And uh, so I've seen a lot, of, uh, a lot of tax policy come before us, a lot of great ideas for job creation and economic development. We also have uh, an economic uh, uh, development committee in our legislature and, and many proposals come from uh, my colleagues that work on that committee where they work closely with with folks that want to create new credits to do different things to incent jobs and business and so we try and work closely with that committee because uh, typically ideas that have tax Im impacts that might come out of them out of the economic growth committee uh, then find their way to the ways and means committee and many times we have members that will approve a credit uh, unanimously and then it'll show up in the Ways and Means Committee and uh, the tax people then start uh, scrutinizing whether uh, we can want to afford it and, and uh, whether it makes sense or not. So we have a lot of people involved in, in that process. We also have a really uh, strong de uh, Department of Revenue that has a good uh, number of people that are dedicated to doing research for the legislature uh, on the work we do and trying to give us uh, some uh, understanding of the of the t tax and finance implications of the various ideas that come forward through the General Assembly. And one of the things we decided to do a number of years ago was begin, one, begin to have a very good data set of, of uh, what the credits are in a, in a tracking system that would allow us kind of year in, year out to know what we we're spending to provide uh, provide the credits, uh, and in in one case we do actually some forecasting. Our Department of Revenue forecasts uh, for a five-year period um, with regular an, regular annual updates uh, projections on uh, how much the credits are going to have an impact on on our state uh, revenues, and uh, that's been a terrific tool for people that work on it in the budgeting process for our appropriations committee chairs and the, and the governor's office to basically be able to predict uh, and budget for the various uh, programs uh, that the legislature has approved. I only have one slide today and it's, uh, it's up right now and it lists the, essentially the 40 tax credit programs, nearly 40 tax credit programs that the state of Iowa has on its books now. And when I think of, of the, the, the chart in front of you, I think about it this way. Uh, we have an appropriation process in the state, like every state, where we have committees in, for education and health care and, and public safety and the environment and natural resources. And they all have a specific amount of money generally that they're given by their leaders to go out and appropriate to do different things whether it's K-12 funding or community college funding or public universities or also in the area of uh, health care. And in, the, in, in most cases, uh, that process is, is very rigorous and members pour over uh, information for a number of weeks during their legislative sessions and everybody's pretty clear about what we're, what we're spending in a given year on education, health care. Uh, public safety, prisons, the courts, etc. Uh, but in the, on the other side of the budget, you have this whole area of tax expenditures, and those are those economic development incentives and the various tax uh, policy that creates jobs that is kind of over here, off to the side, doesn't get the scrutiny, at least not here in Iowa. It's kind of on automatic pilot. If you've created programs up front with caps on them, in other words, we're only going to spend $3 million on this uh, 
venture capital tax credit or this Endow Iowa tax credit, then you, you, you have a sense of that. But a number of programs in Iowa, and I've, the chart shows the, a set of programs, uh, about 20 different credits that have a cap. In other words, we've said, we like this idea, but we're not going to spend more than this amount of money on it. And those are easy to track because we say up front, here's how much we're going to spend on those. We also have about 20 programs that are uncapped. And so it's really important in you know, on these credits, it's based on economic activity. Uh, and so we, we want to track those year to year, to year uh, and, 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 and keep an eye on them. I, I point out a couple of the research activity credit. We have a very generous research activity credit in Iowa. I, I, uh, it's very generous and it's increasing. You can see in 2015 it, we spent about $38 million on it and it's going up another $20 million over two years. So it's important that we pay attention to those that uh, have no uh, kind of uh, end point on them. Um, so th so that, that's an example of, um, I think, I like the idea of cap credits. I take a pretty cautious view about this for the most part. Uh, I'd like to see more of our credits capped. One of the other things that we've done in Iowa, uh, besides paying some attention to uh, cap versus uncapped, uh, is we've create we have another aggregate cap over a, a half a dozen or so credits that we created back in 2010. Um, it was it was 185 million dollars. It went down to 120 in, in a couple years ago as our economy here in Iowa got better. Our economic development people said we need to raise the cap, but we have uh, a number of credits under an aggregated cap uh, as well. So. Uh, there's some awareness about uh, paying some attention to that. We've we've also gone through in past uh, we had we we had a, a film tax credit like many states did that we have since sunset. We had problem. We designed it poorly, got into trouble with it. It became kind of a disaster, and and we phased it out. So we we also have experienced like other states, uh, uh, some of our lawmakers pr providing proposals that. We didn't completely understand what we passed, and and then down the road a year or two, we find this huge liability that nobody, and we look at each other and said, I didn't think that's how this was supposed to happen, and and suddenly we we're in we're in some uh, deep water. The other thing I was done is we uh, back in 2008, uh, when the economy was pretty rough, there was a focus on tax credit spending, like other states. We said, are we getting our money's worth? At a time when we need jobs, are these programs actually creating jobs? And so we created a, uh, a, this thing called a Tax Credit Review Committee. It has members of both the House and Senate Tax Committees and Economic Growth Committees. And we meet during our interim period uh, outside of the legislative session once a year. This year, uh, back in 2015, we met actually twice. And we review on a rotating schedule the some of the good the credits essentially on the screen right now, and we, but typically that in, in, entails the Department of Revenue or our Economic Development Authority presenting for a half an hour. Here's how the credit works. Here's who's getting it, uh, and then of course this is question of whether it's working or not. We haven't really uh, we struggle with that part of it because uh, if you're getting the credit, uh, you're a, a constituency that gets one of those particular uh, job creation credits, you usually show up and say, boy, this thing is working great. Uh, and so it, it's challenging for our nonpartisan staff because occasionally there's disagreements among legislators about whether a credit's effective or not. So it's challenging for our nonpartisan staff to take a side and, and have a position. So mostly what we get through this review process is an understanding of how much we're spending and uh, how the credit works, who gets the credit, and maybe a few ideas on on how to tweak it. Uh, but it, it's been a valuable process. Um, let me let me end by just saying a, a, what the challenges are here in Iowa. We 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 really appreciate the work of uh, P, the Pew Center on the states and keeping us all focused on these important issues. It's a huge amount of money being spent across the across the country, uh, billions of dollars of taxpayer money, and we need far more accountability uh, on this part of our budget. Um, 
one of the things that's been done uh, with the, the form in front of you, it's also been included in the last several years in the budgeting process where all the leaders have to, it's part of our budget packets. Uh, typically, if you want to review the budget with our staff, they'll have five or six pieces of paper. This particular piece of paper was added to what's the ending, what's, a, what's the economic emergency fund, what's the cash reserve, what's the ending balance, all the, here's the spending. And then this particular uh, page was added so that at the time when people look at how much revenue is coming in, they also know what in all the appropriations committees, they can also see this tax, uh, the tax implications on a kind of a snapshot. Here they all are, here's what they're costing and keeping, trying to keep these more front and center in people's minds. Uh, we also use the forecast every year. That we have something called the Revenue Estimating Conference. It's three people that are economic gurus, and they forecast how much new revenue the state is going to have in the coming year so that the legislature knows how much money they might be able to appropriate. And uh, the tax, this tax expenditure forecasting is also a valuable tool for the people that uh, project state revenues because we have income tax and sales tax coming in, but these tax expenditures are basically uh, money going out. They cost money for the state, and it's included in the estimates that we receive. Let me, let me I was going to say, let me end a minute ago, let me end with these things, the challenges. These, these if you look at this list of um, Iowa tax credits, we, we'd probably, it'd probably take uh, a couple eight-hour days to walk through all these and explain them to people on the call so you knew what they were. And uh, it takes a ton of time by legislators also to understand these credits. And uh, right now we really don't have dedicated time uh, when we are together uh, as, a, as, a, as a committee in General Assembly. We meet in Iowa, we meet, we meet from uh, mid-January through about May 1st. We don't really have any dedicated time of like the appropriations committees do uh, on the on the more traditional spending side, to pour over these programs and to really understand how they work, who gets the benefit, what the challenges are, how they can be improved, uh, and that's probably the biggest thing that we need to do here in Iowa to uh, get a better center, better sense of of how these things are actually working. We also, as you know, have turnover in our legislatures, so you have to constantly refresh people on what they did. Many of these credits were passed several years ago or more, and people are like, what, what is this credit? Why are we doing this? Uh, and the other, the other thing I've learned over this 18 years is once you create uh, one of these credits, it's virtually impossible to uh, get it off the books. And I, I, I don't know if that's experience in other States, but so I, you, I encourage people to be very careful and cautious uh, about uh, the next new shiny object that comes to the Capitol that says we have to have this tax credit because it's going to be the next best thing we need to do. Uh, so I encourage people to be cautious about that because I found that with the political pressure from the lobby and and even your colleagues, uh, these things are hard to get rid of, even even if they're not working and people agree they're not working, they are still hard to sometimes remove off the books. It's been great to be on the call. I'd love to have some questions and uh, turn it back. Great, thank you. So now that we've heard from all our presenters, we're happy to take questions. Again, to ask a question, please type your question in the Q&A box in the right-hand corner of your screen. And as we're waiting for some questions to come in, I wanted to let you know that this webinar is being recorded and will be archived on the NCSL website. And it looks like, um, Senator Bolcom, we do have a, a couple of questions for you. The first one, um, the requester says, I understand the forecasts of foregone revenue, but what kind of economic impact analysis do you do in Iowa? For example, um, looking at additional jobs and resulting revenues. Oh, good question. Great question. One of, well, some of, some of the uh, incentives we give actually have job creation requirements and wage requirements, so those are tracked, and we have some sense of those. I don't think we do a very good job of, well, let me say, in the, on a few credits that our Department of Revenue has reviewed, like our historic tax credit, we have a historic tax credit to try and 
have old buildings renovated and be repurposed in some of our downtown, older downtowns. And that's we've seen some some, some economic analysis of that. I think we need to do more of that. Uh, again, it's it's our we've we've had we've done some, and my my experience with it is that our staff um, is reluctant to take a side on a given issue because I think a lot of this is really really hard to do I mean the academic community that looks at this it's it's really it's really hard to determine sometimes the economic benefit of certain credits because we never know if uh, economic activity is going to occur anyway and so you've got that to, to, to factor in as well but I think we all states could probably do a better job of trying to uh, Look at the research and, and and do more research on the total economic value of a given credit. Great, thank you. This is a another question for you. Um, in Iowa, do you any do any analysis of local government incentives such as TIF that also have a state budget impact? We do. We uh, well, I should say we do. We TIF is a is a is a big deal here in Iowa. There's nearly, uh, probably this year, about $350 million worth of property taxes diverted by local governments for so-called economic development activities. We passed a bill uh, four or five years ago after a lot of debate about how to rein it in. Uh, we have a TIF law that's pretty wide open. We have a so-called economic development TIF that goes for 20 years. We have a slum and blight TIF that goes on forever. Uh, and we tried to we tried to put some dates on that and slow those down, and we weren't able to pass legislation to do it. We did end up passing a very robust uh, web-based reporting system by cities. Uh, mostly cities are using TIF in Iowa. It's like the only economic development tool they, they would say they have. And uh, that's been helpful to gather data on how much debt communities are taking on and what kind of projects they're spending money on and how much tax abatement they do. But at this point, the, we have kind of the chambers of commerce and the local government leaders kind of teaming up to kind of resist any kind of uh, uh, reining in, if you will, of uh, tax increment financing here. Thank you. OK, we have another one. And it looks like this could be directed at anyone. Given that businesses play states against each other in search of tax breaks, what can be done to encourage best practices and in information sharing to help states resist the pressure to say yes to the next shiny object that comes along? Uh, the Senator Bolcom, I, I think we ought to have a truce. I um, and I, w I wish there were were that we were required to do less of this. I mean, we we are having a struggle this legislative session on providing enough funding to our K-12 school system uh, because of our revenues and because of how much money we spend in this area. And I think w most people would argue here in Iowa, well, we have to have these programs because there are, our other states have these programs. And so um, I think I think we need to figure out a way to have a truce. I'm, that's probably not very realistic. I'm not sure what the data base would be that we could all share that would, would uh, take people off the ledge about the people coming up here asking for incentives for certain things it's 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 hard for it's hard for us part-time legislators to to spend the kind of time we'd need to, to know you know how other states are trying to take our jobs away and what we need to do about it it's just cool it's very complicated yeah that I agree with the senator and it sure would be fascinating to see visualize how all these businesses play each state against each state. Uh, we know, because we've been in negotiations with businesses that are considering Oklahoma and a handful of other states, we know they do that. And that's their right as a, as a private enterprise in a capitalist society. But it, it's an absolute arms race. There's no doubt about it. Uh, Pandora's box has been opened, if you, if you will, and it, it's really going to be hard for any state to just shut down incentives because they'll be accused of, of closing up shop and allowing other states to recruit businesses. But yeah, short of a, a national truce of some kind or a national database, it, it, it's going to be really tough. But 
I think the more states that put in place evaluation processes and at least have an objective way to evaluate incentives that make sense for their own state, the better. Uh, it's going to cause, I think, people to be more frugal and to demand empirical evidence that these incentives actually caused something to occur that was beneficial to the state. Uh, Iowa is light years ahead of a lot of states, in my opinion, based on the research we've done. <clears throat> you know, Oklahoma and a lot of states are, are catching up, <clears throat> and I think the more states get up to the level that Iowa is and some others and, and really take a hard look at these things, the, the harder it's going to be for businesses to play states against each other. But it, it's always a balancing act because what, what state doesn't want a great new business to come in to their borders and start hiring their citizens and paying tax revenue to support their their core services of government. So it's, it's, it's tough, but I think a lot of economic development professionals, though, would tell you that economic development <clears throat> in many cases is about growing your existing businesses more than it may be bringing in new businesses. It's really hard to get a new business. Uh, a lot of times a new business is, is going to come where you are because there's something wrong with with where they are or because their business is expanding and they would come there anyway. So it's, it's, a, it's a real delicate balancing act, but that's the, in Oklahoma, that's the $1.7 billion question. That's what we spend on incentives each year if you count every little thing we do as a state. Uh, it would be fascinating to see all that visualized uh, in some way. Okay, so this next question sort of follows along the same vein. Um, what sort of information, in your judgment, would be useful in helping to talk legislators out of some of these ideas? Uh, well, this is Josh. Um, I think um, what we see when states start evaluating incentives is, um, you know, the great thing about evaluations is that they're not, if they're done right, yes or no verdicts on these programs. and so. Um, you know, they can point to subtle sort of improvements to programs that it can often greatly improve their effectiveness. And so I, I think the New Mexico High Wage Jobs Tax Credit example that was part of my presentation is a really good example of that where um, it was just little sort of technicalities almost in how the law was written that were really affecting the results of this program that a company um, that was receiving credits in 2011 or 2012 could go all the way back to 20, 2004 for jobs that it had created then and say, oh, we're going to claim these tax credits for these jobs. And so um, I think, you know, um, obviously there's always going to be a combination of factors that determine what incentives um, states offer. You know, politics will always play a role in the process, but when you have better information, it really has helped states figure out what's working, what isn't working, and, and how can we make these things um, better for our budgets, also better for our economy. Right, and this is John in Oklahoma. One thing we've done in Oklahoma to try to raise the bar uh, that, that has to be overtaken before a legislature passes an incentive is we, it's, it's a very simple concept, but we passed a law this year that says that any new incentive that's enacted going forward has to have a measurable goal or goals. That, that sounds like common sense, but almost none of our 70-plus incentives that are on the books in Oklahoma have a stated goal. I think simply stating why you're putting an incentive in place, putting that in your statute, requiring a reporting mechanism, and, and putting clear measurable data, probably even in statutes that, by which that incentive should be measured, uh, is going to make it make legislators think a little more before they put them in place. And I think it's going to cause information to come back to them that will help them determine whether putting it in place was worth it if they do indeed go forward with, with enacting that bill. Great, thank you. Um, just one last question, and this one's for Josh. So what is involved in setting up a process to evaluate incentives? Uh, yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Um, I think the first thing to do is sort of make a plan for evaluation. And um, there are a number of choices you have to do when you're setting up an evaluation process. So. Um, most states that evaluate incentives, um, they don't want to evaluate everything in the same year because as Senator Bolton was saying, um, it's just a lot for, for an analyst to learn about. It's a lot of programs for legislators to get their hands around. So there's some kind of strategic schedule involved where maybe you're evaluating each of your incentives once every three years or four years or five years. Um, you also need to think through um, what is the scope of your process? Is this focused on 
economic development tax incentives. Is this all economic incentives? So grants and loans as well. And states have, um, based on you know where their dollars are going, what their major programs are, what the interest of lawmakers is, have designed different scopes for their processes. Um, and you need to think about you know who's going to do the analysis and what's going to happen to it um, after the analysis is complete. So states have had um, a variety of different people do the evaluations. It could be um, legislative staff, whether that's program evaluation staff, legislative fiscal staff, legislative auditors, um, executive branch agencies such as revenue departments, um, and then some states have worked with outside experts. So Oklahoma's law is going to, um, they're going to hire an academic or private sector economist to, to do some of the analysis for them. Um, then once you, once you have the evaluations, once you have these great reports that tell you what's working, you know, how to make the programs more effective, then it's a matter of getting it back in the hands of lawmakers. And so um, many states, like Iowa, have set up um, new committees that their job is to consider the results of evaluations, to um, you know, hear from stakeholders, hear from businesses, hear from um, other interested parties, and then make decisions about these programs. Should we, should we repeal them? Should we reform them? Um, should we retain them, as, as John said earlier? Um, and so I think those are, those are some of the first steps. And, um, really, it's crucial to see how the process is working for you, and if, if there are ways to make improvements, make improvements over time. Great. Thank you. Um, next slide, please. So this brings us to the conclusion of this webinar. If you have any questions following this event, please feel free to contact me. My contact information is listed on the screen. Next slide, please. And as a reminder, the full text of any report highlighted today, along with additional resources, is available through both the NCSL and Pew websites. Next slide. And lastly, um, thank you again for participating. And please take a moment to share your feedback on this webinar by taking a short survey at the link listed on the screen. We really appreciate your interest and participation today. Thanks.